Uh, a quick reminder of what we were doing yesterday. So the, the main problem I was looking at was um, evaluating formulas in graphs. Yeah? So model checking problem for first order logic, for monadic second order logic, and um, in graphs or general structures, everything works with general structures, uh, yeah, and there's no real change. And we started to look at uh, the, the tractability model we were looking at, or I was looking at, to be more precise, is uh, fixed point tractability. So we were aiming for algorithms which uh, run in time sort of f of the size of the formula or the quantifier rank of a formula uh, times uh, a linear or lower polynomial in the size of the input graph. Yeah? And, uh, yeah, and this is a, a complexity model which um, allows us to distinguish between different graph classes here because you can take these uh, classes into account. And it's a slight refinement of uh, Moshe's uh, original definition of data complexity as a polynomial time for every formula. This is now a fixed degree polynomial for every formula, but the big O notation hides something that depends on the formula. Yeah? Uh, and uh, we saw yesterday that if, if you have monadic second order logic where you're allowed to quantify over sets of vertices as well as sets of edges, uh, called MSO2, which is technically just normal plain monadic second order logic on incident encodings. Uh, we saw tractability in bound tree with graphs, and you've seen what this is. Um, and uh, today we'll go all the way up to here in the first uh, afternoon session, and then we see something up there yeah. uh, in the next session. Yeah? And uh, we, what I want to prove next is actually this result here. You see that first order logic eventually will become FPT on Novadense graphs. And uh, we start at the very bottom, uh, because this introduces all the technology, and then we we see how to extend, right? And where we stopped yesterday was this theorem here. Uh, Guyton's theorem, which says every first order formula is equivalent to a Boolean combination of basic local sentences. And a basic local sentence is uh, something like this. It just says, I have uh, m vertices in my graph, and the distance between any pair of them is more than two times r for some constant r. Yeah. And, uh, each of these formulas in their R neighborhood satisfies uh, a first order formula Psi. Yeah? And this Psi was restricted to be R local, which means it depends only on the R neighborhood. Yeah? There might be a slightly more, I mean, if you know relati relativization in logic, so you relativize every quantifier to, to a certain set. Yeah? Uh, because the, the R neighborhood of a, for, of, a, of, a, uh, of a vertex, of course, is first order definable. Yeah? It's just a definable by the formula, let's say, phi of y, no, so phi of x and y, yeah, which is just the distance between x and y is at most r, right? And so for any fixed x, uh, this formula would just define its r neighborhood. And then you can just take any first order formula in here and then just relativize every quantifier. So if you're quantifying about uh, over a y in the formula, we just replace it by there is a y and then the distance between x and y, uh, sorry, is it most r? And then whatever it says here. And the same for universal quantifiers. Yeah? And so by, by doing this syntactic transformation, you actually force this entire formula to be uh, local. Yeah? And then you don't have to worry about it semantically. Yeah? So that, that would be the easier way of doing it. Yeah? Uh, is it in M, is it in R, is it in the size, do you remember? Uh, it's in the quantifier rank, yeah. No, but is M, what, what, what is large in phi? Phi can be have large, uh, M can M be M is large. M is large. M, M is large. Yeah. Okay, well, I can prove it. I mean, uh, I can take, but this is what happened yesterday. Yeah? You, 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 this is why we were so slow, because I was proving all these things I didn't want to prove. Uh, but now, since you ask, I mean, the, because it's very easy uh, if you don't uh, do any technical details. So what you can just do is you can uh, you encode numbers by trees. Yeah? So you, I mean, just uh, any natural number you try to encode as a tree, and you can show you can do this very concisely. Uh, so if you if you allow only trees of uh, height at most h, yeah, you can encode some numbers up to the the height of h. Yeah. So numbers between one and zero actually and this number you can encode. Yeah? It's more or less a number of different uh, isomorphism types of trees of height uh, at most h, yeah? and this is very big. And so each of them uh, you can associate to a number, a natural number between this big number and, and one. Yeah? 
and you can show um, that for every such height h, there is a first order formula, this phi k, where k is actually h, yeah, um, which can distinguish with the, these numbers. Yeah? So there is a formula saying, uh, if you give it two trees of this height, saying the number encoded by the second tree is one plus the number encoded by the first tree. So you have addition. Um, and you can find a formula saying the number encoded by one tree is less than the number encoded by uh, another tree. Yeah? So you've got all these trees encoding some numbers. Yeah? And then uh, with, with very small formulas, you can say uh, less than or plus one if you want, and, and strictly less and equality. Yeah? And so uh, in this formula, you can just say uh, my input graph contains for every number between 0 and 2 to the 2 to the blah 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 height h minus 1 a tree representing it. The formula here would just say, uh, I'll squeeze it in here, yeah? so phi k just says uh, for every i between 0 and 2 to the minus 1, yeah, there is a tree representing it. This you can do with this size of formulas. I mean, it's getting, getting smaller. I think Nicole actually brought this down to something k square or something, but it doesn't matter. Yeah? But now you think of this as a basic local sentence, eh? because this is, these are disconnected graphs. Yeah? And uh, so any two vertices in different trees have high distance, and any two vertices within the same tree are very close to each other, yeah? so, uh, because it's, it's bound of height. Yeah? And so if you want a basic local sentence or a Boolean combination of basic local sentences, they would actually speak about all these trees. Yeah? Uh, you need a quantifier for every tree. Yeah, you, you somehow need uh, to say, there is an X1 and this sits in one tree, and if you want to do something about another tree, then it has to be another, uh, a different quantifier. Yeah? And uh, so there, there can't be any short formulas. I mean, of course, you need to prove it yeah, and uh, make it a bit more technical, but um, uh, this is the whole point of the construction. Yeah, because there's no way in the, in the basic, I mean, yeah, maybe this is the better argument to say this in, in 30 seconds. Uh, within such a local formula, there's no way to sp uh, of speaking about two different trees, yeah, because they will never be local, the distance is infinite. Yeah? So in any basic local sentence, you, this thing here will speak about a, a single tree. And uh, so you can just say for any number of uh, dis distinct trees you want, yeah, uh, something, yeah, but you can't connect them, but you have to connect them. I mean, if you want to say every, every number is present, then you need to say something about uh, two numbers at the same time. Yeah, because for some reason, you, I mean, otherwise you can't just say they're all present. Yeah. And so the basic local sense, the, the combination, the Geiffen normal form equivalent to this would basically just say, uh, for every number there is between zero and uh, two to the, well, this number here, uh, you, you have a basic local sentence saying, okay, the tree representing this number is, exists. And this is a super big, uh, big formula. All right. Um, okay, let's go on. Uh, yeah, this, this is the theorem I want to prove now. There was this little uh, exercise I set. Uh, so we just want to define by a Geiffen normal form that the graph contains two vertices which are not adjacent, and one is red and one is green. Did anybody figure out how it, how it works? Yeah? Basically, do a big outer aura for which k colors we're going to use. And then it's easy to say, once we've chosen k colors, basically you say x1 is color 1. Yeah, but this you can't, right? Because how do you say x1 is color 1? Well, because statically you have l colors. So you can, yeah. on the outside, have a big aura for which k colors we're going to use. Okay, I give you only two colors. And now only about two vertices, uh, one of each color, which are not adjacent. Well, that's fine. Then I, then I can say x1. Yeah, that's uh, just... So how do you say this? So, so you know, exists x1, exists x2, distance greater than 1. So x1, there is x2, yeah, distance, yeah. Greater than 1, um, yeah. and cx1, sorry, c1, x1, c2, x2. Yeah, but this you can't, that's the point, yeah. And, uh, sorry, how do I actually call this then? Well, that's the point, because uh, this is the distance formula, and but now you just say uh, psi of x1 and psi of x2, right? Yeah. To be a basic local sentence. Yeah. But these are R local. Yeah. 
Uh, and it's actually the same R as here, right? So it's actually, it would have to be two times one. Yeah, they're fixed size, but C1 of X1 is. Yeah, but they same. Okay, so, you, so this one says C1 of X, yeah? But then you enforce both to be the same color, right? Yeah, but basically you have to say that either there, are, there is only one red and one green, and then you can say that they are not connected. Uh, yes. Or uh, you say that there exists some red and at least two green. And uh, then if they, are, if they are far one from the other, then necessarily there is some edge missing yes. between yes. the red. Yes, but th this is the construction you do, right? Uh, what you're saying is, um, well, there are, uh, I'm not, okay. You translate it for yourself in first order logic, yeah? What you're saying is um, there are two, two red nodes of high distance. Yeah, and high here could be something like bigger than, than four. Also, to, to be far apart. Um, and there is a green node. Yeah. Uh, this would just mean, well, if you have a graph and here's a red and very far away is another red, and even if there's only one green, yeah, it will be far apart from at least one of the two reds. Yeah. Or there's only one red, or we, no, or all the reds are very close. Yeah, and then you need to do something about the greens within this neighborhood. Yeah? And uh, this would be the second part of this formula. Yeah? Because then you can just say, and I don't want to write it down, the, the other option would be, which is uh, this branch here, or it's only one red node, and in its R neighborhood, which R is just one here in this case, yeah? uh, all the other red nodes are, are in it. Yeah? And then you can just say, well, how many green nodes of distance two can I have yeah, in this neighbor? There's only one of them. Yeah? Because if you want distance at least two, uh, or at least three, let's say, uh, you can only have one of these green nodes in here. And so your basic local sentence can just say, I have two green nodes which are far apart, yeah, which is exactly the same as we see here, in which case you're done. Or there's only, or, all the green nodes are clustered around a uh, center. Yeah? But then it means all the greens will be in here, yeah, but then the basic local, uh, the local formula can actually determine whether there's a red and a green which are not adjacent. Yeah? So this, there's accounting involved in this uh, construction. Yeah? And uh, if you understand this argument, then you, you know the proof of Gaussian's theorem because this is exactly what you're doing. Yeah? Of course, if you want to translate general first of formulas, uh, there's a technical, I mean, it's more complicated technically, but the, the, this is the essential idea how to count. All right, uh, but now, uh, without losing too much time, um, let's uh, prove this theorem I wanted to prove. Namely, we have first of model checking uh, is FPT on any class of graphs of bounded of maximum degree at most D. Uh, in fact, there, you'll see the algorithm runs in, uh, in time where the parameter is K, the size of the formula plus, the, plus D, uh, and it's linear in the number of vertices. And this was originally proved by very different techniques uh, by Seize, he was using Hanf uh, normal forms. And the proof we see here is by Martin Grohe and uh, Marcus Frick, and this is the proof that extends to lots of classes, actually. Okay, um, so why did I say anything about Geifman? Because Geifman will give us the main ingredient uh, to solve this problem. By Geifman's theorem, uh, we can take any first of formula into a Boolean, con uh, Boolean combination of basic local sentences. And so if I know how to verify such a sentence in the graph, I can verify any formula, yeah? because you translate into Boolean combination of these for every basic local sentence in your graph for normal form, you check whether it's true or not. And then, of course, it's just propositional logic. Yeah. So this is the main thing we need to prove, uh, these guys. Yeah. So here's now, suppose the input is now a basic local sentence, and we have a graph of maximum degree D. Yeah. So there it is. And uh, so what do we do? The, the goal is now to, do, to find this. Yeah, we need m vertices of distance more than 2r pairwise, and locally in the r neighborhood, they should satisfy this formula psi. Yeah? And uh, the way to do it is so, yeah, we don't know how to do it, so we just do a brute force, let's say. Uh, in the first step of the algorithm, we just go through every possible vertex in our graph. For every vertex we have, we compute its r neighborhood, so this thing. And now we just test whether this R neighborhood satisfies the, the inner local formula psi, yeah? 
of it. And uh, if it does satisfy this formula, then we color this vertex red, and otherwise it stays black. But I mean, how big is such a neighborhood? Yeah? The, the, the radius is R, and the degree is D. Yeah? So you can't have many vertices in it. Yeah? In fact, it will be D to the R plus one vertices at most in this neighborhood. Yeah? And so this is bounded by, by the parameter, and we can just brute force in this, in this neighborhood. Yeah? So the size of this thing only depends on the parameter and, the, uh, and not on the, the graph itself. And so we can just test it by any means you want. Yeah. And so we do this for every vertex. And now at the end of the day, we, we have possibly we have a few red vertices and the rest is uh, black. And the running time we, we spend with, well, this is n iterations of this loop. Yeah. Computing this thing uh, by BFS or so, it's a uh, constant time because the, the neighborhood is constant size. It's actually d to the r plus one, but never, never mind. Yeah. Um, o of one, and uh, then we test this. It's also constant because it's a constant size neighborhood. Yeah. So that's fine. It's linear time plus something. And uh, now we have to just. I mean, th this is what we have, and the only thing we need to find now is a uh, an independent set in it, a, a set of vertices of pairwise distance uh, to r or, or more. Yeah. And so the other problem: How do we do this? Okay, you can read the argument or you can just see what happens. Well, we do it greedily. Yeah. You just start, okay, well, just pick one. Yeah. I just, uh, I want to create, or find my independent set greedily, so I just pick a red vertex and put it in my independent set. And once I've chosen this one, of course, I can't take any other red vertex which is too close to it, yeah, because it wouldn't be independent enough. Yeah. So I delete all the, uh, the other red nodes which are too close. I'll pick the next one, yeah. add it to my set, and then these are no longer possible, they're too close. <laughs> I'll take the next one, yeah, and uh, this one disappears, and uh, no, everything has disappeared. Yeah? There's a maximum set I can choose greedily, um, but I wanted actually to have four vertices of uh, big distance, but I only found three in this greedy approach. Of course, if this greedy approach will stop uh, with m vertices, we are done, yeah? We, then you can just, you found the solution, so you say yes. But of course, it could go wrong, like in this case. And do you see this uh, solution, uh, why, wh what we do next? It's, 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 it's easy, easy. Some, because some number of vertices, no? Yes, because um, well, what, what, what do we know at the set? Uh, every vertex now is close to one of the elements we've chosen. Yeah? Otherwise, we could just uh, go on greedily. And we have chosen less than m vertices. Right? And m is also something that depends on the parameter because it's the, the size of the, the number of quantifiers in the Geifman form. Um, and so we can throw everything away in the graph and just uh, keep the, the neighborhoods of these vertices we've chosen, and that will contain any red. Now this is constant size, yeah, because this is an R neighborhood, and we know that R neighborhoods around a vertex have only a constant number of vertices. And this is a disjoint union of uh, at most m minus one R neighborhoods. And so the number of vertices will be m times d to the r plus one at the most. And uh, so it's constant, and in fact here we can just brute force to find a uh, uh, 2R independent set of size M. And I do not want to brute force because uh, as logicians, the other way of doing it is just say, in the 2R neighborhood around these vertices in my set L, I can verify this formula here that just says I have M vertices of pairwise distance 2R and they're all red. Yeah. This is again a basic local sentence that I need to check. But now it's a constant size subgraph and I can check it. But there's a reason I'm stating it like this, and you see this reason on the next slide. But is this argument uh, clear? Because that will repeat over and over again uh, in, in basically everything we do. Well, if not, then ask now, because uh, like I said, it would be good for this to. Yeah. And uh, this is the reason. Yeah, let me go, go one back. I mean, all we know is that this distance here between these two, two elements, that red is a bad color, Blue. This here is more than uh, 2R, right? Because it was chosen greedily. But um, now let's delete this. And uh, for these uh, elements we've chosen, we know not take the R neighborhood, but the 2R neighborhood. Yeah, they can overlap, yeah, if you like, like in this case. Or maybe this one doesn't. Yeah, so this is 2R, and this is 2R, and this is 2R. And uh, the reason we are taking the two R neighborhoods, I mean, do you see the reason we are, t we are taking it? Why, why do we study the two R neighborhoods around the vertices in L and not just the R neighborhoods? The reason we take two R is because 
the 2R neighborhood of the vertices in our set L will actually contain the R neighborhoods of every possible red vertex in the entire graph. Yeah? Because we know every red vertex is uh, a distance at most R from, from the one we've chosen. And so every vertex in its, two R, in its R neighborhood has distance at most 2R from a vertex we've chosen. Yeah? And so if you take the union of the 2R neighborhoods around these, uh, these vertices in L, this covers anything, every red vertex, and also everything that of distance at most R from a red vertex. And so if you, if you find, like in this case, that the 2R neighborhoods are separate, then the distance between any red here and any red here is bigger than 2R. Right? So you can just pick them independently. But it could happen, like in this case, that the, the neighborhoods overlap, yeah? and then because this vertex is too close to this one, for instance. Um, but now this covers everything, and uh, the, the rest of the vertices don't matter. There will not be on the shortest path between any red pair of red vertices that will not be interesting at all. Uh, so we just keep whatever the rest. Yeah. Um, so let's backtrack a little bit. We, w what is it we've done? I mean, this proves the theorem. It's the first uh, step we can just do. We can be proud of ourselves. Um, what is running time? Well, it's linear, yeah, because I, we, the computing the red vertices was a linear time affair, and they are greedy is a linear time affair, more or less, yeah, in this graph. And um, yeah, then the rest is constant. Yeah, so it's just uh, linear anyway. Yeah? So the whole thing is a linear time algorithm where the big O notation depends on, your, on, on our form. And this shows the uh, Caesar theorem in a different uh, proof technique. The proof actually does show a lot more, yeah, because where did we actually use that, that the input graphs that had bounded degree? Yeah, I mean, of course we did use it, um, but where? It was only at two places, right? One was here, yeah? in the first step where we found the red vertices, which are these vertices whose R neighborhood satisfy the local formula Psi. Yeah? And here we use the fact that the, the, the degree of the graphs is bounded to, to reason that then the number of vertices in these neighborhoods is constant, so we can just check uh, the local formula. Because th that's an arbitrary first order formula, but, uh, so we need to be able to check it in the, in the neighborhood. Well, we didn't actually need that this was a bounded degree. All we needed was you can check the first order formula in this neighborhood. And if you tell me a different method how to do it, then that would be fine. There's nothing special about degree boundedness here. And the second place where we are using it is uh, here. Yeah? Because in this greedy approach, once we found the uh, most parameter many elements in the set L, we were looking at the union of the two R neighborhoods of this set. And then again, we were verifying this formula here, and that's the reason I'm actually stating this as a first order formula. But this again is just, as you see here, it's just evaluated in the neighborhood of a constant set of uh, vertices. Yeah? And so essentially, the, the, the crux of this whole matter and the, the core of this argument is uh, if you is evaluating formulas in bounded radius neighborhoods. And if you give me any class of graphs where I can just check formulas in our local, I mean, in, in, in our neighborhoods around the vertex, then the same proof will go through. I mean, you just plug, plug this in as a black box and you're happy. And uh, so this uh, suggests a, a far more general technique, which is called local model checking, if you want. So, which is this theorem, which really is what we have proved. If it sees any class of graphs, whatever it is, for which the following problem here is fixed product attractable. Yeah? So the, you're given a first order formula, anyone, you're given a graph G from your class and K vertices and a radius, and the parameter is R plus K plus phi. Yeah, so anything depending on R and K and phi, you can spend as much time on as you want. And uh, you need to be able to decide if the R neighborhood around these uh, most K vertices you're given satisfies the formula phi. Right? If this is doable in FPT time, then you can solve the entire first or model checking problem on, on the class C. Yeah? By exactly the same argument as before. You give me a formula and a general graph in C. I compute its Geiffen normal form. I check for every vertex in my graph, compute its R neighborhood, and check using this subroutine here whether the local formulas are true. If they are, I color them red. Yeah? And then I do this greedy approach to find, uh, you know, M. Uh, M vertices of distance more than 2R pairwise. If I don't, then I compute the union of their 2R neighborhoods and again apply the subroutine to check. Yeah. And so this is really the theorem we, we just proved. And this turns out to be extremely useful um, because there are many more and far more general types of graphs which allow local model checking. 
Yeah, and so the, the crux, and this is of course what, what Geiffen's theorem really is about. I mean, the, the ideological statement of Geiffen's theorem is, uh, whatever you can say in first or logic, you can, it's just something you say about neighborhoods. Yeah, I mean, about local properties. Yeah, th this is why it's called a locality theorem. And uh, so the consequence is just here for efficient first or model checking, it suffices as every neighborhood in a graph is well behaved. The, the whole graph can be as bad as it wants, but the, every neighborhood has to be, our neighborhood has to be somehow attractable and well behaved. And for instance, not the entire graph needs to have small tree width. It would be enough if the R neighborhoods have found a tree width. Yeah? Because then we could just check locally whether the formulas are true. And this idea can turn into a definition. Uh, it, yeah? it goes back to Epstein, actually, but uh, this concept of found at local tree width. So we can just define for every graph G the local tree width, which is just a bound on the tree width of neighborhoods. Yeah? And of course, because the radius uh, R determines the size of the neighborhood, and we, we can also let the tree width grow with the, with, uh, the higher well radius. And so the local tree width of a graph is just a function assigning to every possible radius the maximum tree width in, uh, of any R neighborhood in your, in your graph. Uh, a class of graphs is bounded local tree width if there's any such function from n to n which dominates the local tree width for every member of your class. Yeah. And so if you have a bounded local tree width class, it just means if you the, the tree width of any R neighbor just depends on the radius. Right? And on any, any such class, you can just do the same model checking trick and you're done. Yeah, because, uh, and this turned out to be quite general. So every class of graphs of binary degree, of course, is bounded like a tree width is what we, I mean, it's constant size neighborhoods. Yeah? Uh, but planar graphs, for instance, have bounded like a tree width. This is a theorem by Robertson and Seema, where that the planar graph the, of diameter R has tree width at most three times R. Well, in fact, it's, uh, it's radius and not diameter, but it doesn't, it's even better. Yeah, yeah and so if in the planar graph you want very high tree width, then you need also very broad graph. And you can't have them sort of all close together and high tree width. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, and there are many other classes. And so if any, any of you happens to know anything about sort of graph minus, then the, this decomposition, you, you get a, uh, decomposes the graph into a subclass of uh, bounded local tree width, for instance. So it's a, quite a nice concept. And so this trick actually takes us up all the way up to, to bounded local tree width graphs, which is the, the proof by frequent grow. And then similar techniques takes you up even a little bit further. Yeah. And uh, not in this picture, but if you sort of, uh, there were initially like uh, excluded minus, whatever there is, there's a model checking algorithm, and then you can extend this to locally excluded minus. And somebody did some model checking for bound expansion, you can extend it to locally bound expansion using the same trick. Yeah. It doesn't always come for free because uh, the extension on the graph theory side can be hard, but uh, on the logic side, you get this for free. Yeah. All right, but uh, so this is the, the other trick, and now we want to go up uh, and see the, uh, the novel dense case. I mean, yeah, to so get a precise characterization of model checking on sparse classes. All right, uh, and that's the next theorem I want to prove, yeah, uh, which is this one here. So, okay, it's phrased a bit awkwardly. Uh, okay. One way of phrasing is to say every problem that's definable in first order logic can be decided in time n to the one plus epsilon for every possible epsilon on any class of graphs that's nowhere dense. Yeah. Or uh, another way of saying this actually, uh, first order logic model checking is uh, FPT on any class of graphs which is nowhere dense. Yeah. No, no, you'll see this on the next slide. Actually, I spent much of uh, the next half an hour defining it, and then, uh, yeah. And uh, it's, there, there was way before this, um, there was this, this theorem here. It was actually not very hard to see at all. Uh, if you have a class of graphs, which you can close under taking subgraphs, yeah? So whenever you have a member of your, your class, uh, then every subgraph of it is also a member of it, yeah? Like every subgraph of a planar graph is a planar graph, yeah? Every subgraph of a graph excluding a minor excludes a minor. And, uh, and, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Uh, and on any such class of graphs, uh, if it is not nowhere dense, then the model checking problem for first order logic is not FPT, yeah, unless. And so the consequence of these both, uh, these th theorems together is uh, if you have classes of graphs close on the subgraphs, then first order model checking is FPT if and only if this class is nowhere dense. Yeah. Modular assumption. Yeah, yeah, modular. You lost, you lost the assumption somewhere. Yeah, 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 unless. And uh, maybe this is a disclaimer I should be making. Uh, I don't know. I mean, 
all of this is subject to some, I mean, all the lower bounds are subject to some assumptions. If so P is the same as P space, then uh, Emerson model checking is, uh, is for moment time solvable, and then of course you can just draw it. Because Q is also for graphs, graph classes closed under. Sorry again? The first theorem is also for graph classes closed under the subgraphs. No, well, the upper bound uh, doesn't matter. I mean, for the for the upper bound, you just need that your class is nova dense. Yeah? But for the lower bound, you need some closure property. Which was my initial plan. Then you see the lower bound techniques. You see why we have to close on the subgraphs. Yeah? Um, all right. So this is the, uh, the the theorem. And as you see from the from the from the years, um, if you go back a little bit. I mean, this is very old, okay, depending on how you're, okay, I mean, for you guys, this is like uh, ancient, yeah? It's the 1990s, yes? Yeah? Um, and this is 96, and then there is, uh, these appeared already in journals in 2001. And then not, little, for a while, not so much happened, but then the, the lower one was already 2009, so this was uh, something we saw quite, quite, quite early, that you can't go beyond Nova Dance, yeah? And then it became really like a, like a race, or sort of like the, the, the holy grail was to get this result for Nova Dance actually, because we knew you can't go beyond. And uh, this was what people were trying, and, and all of this happened along the way. A few more remarks. I mean, you can do this. I, I'm doing this only for sentences. Yeah? So you want to just check properties and graphs. You can as well take formulas with um, free variables and you count the number of solutions, for instance. Yeah? This is enumeration problems or counting problems. Uh, and there's also very nice work on solving these on these graph classes. Yeah? Can you actually enumerate the solution to a formula? Can you count the number of solutions? Uh, the answer is usually yes. And uh, Luke Segofer and various co-authors can tell you why uh, this happens. Yeah? And there's some more work on approximations, but I'm not covering this here. Uh, just to say that there's life beyond uh, decision problems. Yeah? All right, so let's prove this, uh, this theorem here. And um, what I need to prove, well, what I need to explain actually is what Nova Dance says. Yeah? And uh, we are getting there, but uh, I've been saying a lot about we, we work on sparse classes of graphs, and we did so simply because um, this is motivated by this algorithmic uh, sort of application in parameterized algorithms, and they were all working on sparse classes of graphs, especially on excluded minor classes, which come out of this robertson seymour uh, theory. And so, also, there's a very well-developed structure theory, and this is why, why we all started to do sparse classes. Well, what does it mean to be sparse? I mean, at some point, we need to define what it actually means to be sparse. And uh, I said, a class is sparse if the number of edges is relatively low compared to the number of vertices. Um, more precisely, the number of edges is relatively low compared to the maximum number of edges you can have in a graph, which is n squared. But we need uh, some mathematical definition if you actually want to speak about this. And so how can you define sparse classes? Well, here's the first attempt. Uh, you bound the average degree. You just say I count the number of fetches divided by the number of vertices. It's the average degree. And then I say a class of graphs is sparse if uh, this is bounded by some constant d. This makes sense, yeah, because the number of fetches is uh, at most uh, d times the number of vertices divided by 2 or so. Uh, so this looks, looks good. Yeah? And uh, you can study this class to find an average degree. Um, but they're not very useful because they're not very stable as a model for sparseness. Yeah? Because you take any class of bounded, uh, graph of bounded average degree, and you just add a huge number of isolated vertices. Yeah? I mean, a big number, like n squared or so. Then uh, suddenly, you, it will have bounded average degree. And it doesn't matter at all what this graph looks like. But you haven't really changed uh, the problem, the graph, very much, yeah, because it's just isolated vertices. Yeah? So if you're looking for anything interesting uh, in your graph, like in the first of the formula, then these isolated vertices you can just throw away. Yeah? So of course, if you're looking for an independent set, then yes, uh, this is nice. Yeah? If you're looking for a dominating set, then it doesn't help. Yeah? Each of these will be in the dominating set, and then you need still an optimal solution here. Yeah? And so, bound average degree is not a really nice measure because of this simple cheating trick. So, the first property you can require is to say a sparse class of graphs should actually be preserved by taking subgraphs to prevent this kind of, you don't have to believe in it, of course, but if you believe in it, then, I mean, I do, and so it, that's what we see now. So, here's the second uh, attempt. This is known as binary degeneracy, which is exactly this. Yeah, you want... Um, uh, you, you want classes which are closed and they're taking subgraphs, and then every subgraph has bounded average degree. It would be a natural definition. 
which uh, would just say these kind of constructions here would disappear. Yeah? Yeah, so, and the graph is D degenerate if every subgraph of it contains a vertex of degree at most D, which means every subgraph has bound at average degree. But again, you can treat, yeah, because you can just take a subgraph which is a clique. So this subgraph clearly will not have a, a bounded average degree uh, at all. But now you subdivide every edge here. Yeah? So instead of this edge between these two vertices, you now take a path of length two. Yeah? So you just put a new vertex in, so subdividing this edge. And so what you get is so suddenly something that has bounded average degree, yeah? because now the number of vertices you have is, uh, the, these light blue vertices is the same as the number of edges. And furthermore, every subgraph of this has bounded average degree. Yeah? Because, I mean, it's like a, like a set of trees in these uh, subdivisions. Yeah? And again, this is not very nice, yeah, because if you want to evaluate first order logic formulas on such a graph, yeah, then of course it's very easy to rewrite the first order formula to work on this graph. Yeah? I mean, you just subdivide every edge by a new vertex, you color these new vertices light blue, and then your first order formula, whenever it says there is an edge between x and y, you could just rewrite it to say there's a light blue vertex and x is connected to this light blue vertex, and the light blue one is also connected to y. I mean, it's very, very easy to define the first order formula. If you have a formula on the graph, uh, you can rewrite it to a formula on this graph yeah, to say the same thing. Um, and for this reason, I think it makes sense to say a sparse graph should maybe also be closed under undoing these cheating constructions. Yeah? And uh, so if you subdivide every edge by a constant number of vertices, then my, in my class I should be able to undo this, this cheating trick. And so it should be preserved by undoing and make this a, a precise on the next slide. Yeah? And so if you agree that these two properties are nice, then there's exactly no dense. So class of graphs is no dense exactly if it has these two properties. Yeah? It's because on subgraphs and they can do undo this uh, bounded uh, subdivisions. All right, uh, and so this is now the, the formal definition. Uh, a class of graphs is uh, no dense if we have well, for every radius r, there's a number f of r so that the complete graph on f of r vertices is not a bounded minor of t. And now I need to define what this is actually, bounded minor. And uh, so let's just draw it. So what is, does anybody know what a minor is? Yeah, okay. Um, do you know what a subdivision is? All right, let's define it properly. So what is a subdivision? I, I take a graph edge. No? This is your graph. And a subdivision just means you replace every edge by a path of any length. Yeah? So you just take a graph and you subdivide it, so you, it keeps the same vertices, but now where there was an edge before, like this edge, you now have a path of any length. Yeah? This is a subdivision. Yeah? And uh, you can say, a graph H is a topological minor of another graph G if uh, G has a subgraph which is isomorphic to any subdivision of H. Yeah? I won't be needing this definition really, but uh, so let's say H is a topological minor, topological minor if uh, H prime is a subdivision of H. There exists such a thing, and H prime is just a normal subgraph of G. Yeah? So you take G, you, you delete some vertices, and you delete some edges, and what remains is the subdivision of your graph. Yeah? Or if you want to see it the other way around, which is easier to see maybe if this is G, yeah? and you want to find your, your graph H as a topological minor, it means you need to find vertices in your graph G, one for every vertex of H, yeah? so one, two, three. And then you just need this joint path connecting these vertices in the same way as they are connected in your graph edge. And if you find this, there's a topological minor, if and only if. Yeah? Okay, and, and now the only, so th this is general topological minors and uh, they, they've been studied a lot and so on. But now we relativize this to a fixed radius. Yeah? And so we call this a, an R subdivision Yeah, if the length of any such path you replace an edge by is at most r. Yeah. That's all. Yeah. So you bound the length of any such thing you need to, to, to do. Yeah. 
And so we can also say H is a, is a topological R, sub, R topological minor of G if uh, there is such an R subdivision of H which is a subgraph of G. Or if you want this picture, then, then you find this path of length at most R, right? And that's it. All right. And now a class of graphs is now over dense. If for every radius R, so for every value of R, there is some graph H, which, and you can take it to be a complete graph, yeah, which is not a depth R topological minor of your graph, of any member of your class. So it means, I mean, in theory, your class of graphs can contain arbitrarily big cliques as, uh, as minors. But if you want a very, very big clique, then you need to contract, I mean, you need to contract extremely long path. Okay. And I realize I haven't defined what contractor means. So in case you don't know what a minor is, uh, let me just define this as well, because it's a nice notion. A minor is just the following thing. If you have an edge in your graph, yeah, the contraction just means you, you contract these two vertices in a single vertex, keeping all the neighbors. Yeah? So if that was uh, your graph before, yeah? then you can contract this, which means you have one big, big new node, and then it has the same neighbors. And a minor is just something you get from a graph by deleting some vertices, deleting some edges, or contracting a few other edges. Yeah? And so another way of seeing topological minors is you can just contract th this path into a single edge, and this one here, and this one here, and kill everything else, and what you get is exactly H. All right, and this is a definition of Nova dense, and uh, this is a it's the shortest definition you can, can give. Yeah? Uh, the only downside of it is it doesn't tell you anything about how they look like at these graphs. Yeah? I mean, unless you happen to work in graph minus, it will not probably tell you a lot about what these graphs are. Um, so if, fortunately for us, these are very general classes, and they, and you can prove that this is exactly the two properties we have, yeah? because you're closed under subgraphs, because you're allowed to delete uh, vertices, yeah? and uh, you can undo sort of bounded uh, subdivision of any edge. Yeah? And so uh, examples for Novadense classes of graphs are class excluding a fixed minor, class of bounded local tree width, uh, classes of bounded expansion, which you don't know what they are, um, planar graphs, uh, classes of bounded tree width, uh, of bounded degree, all, all, all these things. Um, Non-examples are the two things we didn't want, degenerate graphs and average degree classes. And there's also other notions like clique that some of you might have heard of that's also not more dense because they're extremely dense. All right, so let me say a few words uh, about more dense classes of graphs. Yeah? Here's an even uglier definition, yeah, but it's, uh, it's nice, but it's very ugly. And it's not useful for anything at all, but... Uh, it basically also explains why we call it sparse. Let's define this, uh, this notion here. Yeah? So you, you have a class of graphs, yeah? and you, for every member of your class, you look at all the subgraphs of it, or more pre precisely, everything you get by as an R topological minor. Yeah? So H is an R topological minor of G, and then you take the you take this one here, so the log of the number of edges divided by the log of the number of vertices. Yeah. And uh, obviously this will result in a number between zero and two. Yeah. Because, I mean, the, the maximum number of edges you can have is n squared, roughly. Yeah. And uh, so log n squared divided by log n would be two. Yeah. There's a theorem by Neschertrell and uh, Othona de Mendes who invented this no this no denseness that if you have a class of graphs and you take the limit of this radius and the number of vertices in your graph to the to infinite, uh, you would end up actually in only three possible values. One is zero, which these are edges, uh, graphs with only constant number of edges. The other possible value is one, and then you go up to two. Uh, this is what you get. It's a slightly surprising theorem. I thought it was very surprising when I saw it. Um, once you see the proof, it's not so surprising. Yeah, but, uh, and uh, the Nova dense class of graphs are those for which you get the value at most one. And the dense classes of graphs are, are those for which you get two. And there's a clear distinction between dense and non-dense uh, graph. Or another way of saying this, um, if you take a very dense graph, I mean, if you're not Nova dense, it means if you take the, the radius to infinity, I mean, you're allowed to contract arbitrary long path into, sorry, into a single edge, uh, then you get every clique as a, uh, in your class. Yeah? So you can generate every possible clique, because otherwise you wouldn't be getting this value of two if you think about it. 
uh, so every click will be somehow contained in your graph uh, as long as you're allowed to sort of contract very long path. All right, there's another definition. Uh, again, I, I won't be using it. It's nice somewhere. But in terms of once you start looking at Novadens classes of graphs, they have a billion different definitions, and they're all equivalent. And um, they come out of very different areas and proof techniques and things, and then you, you look at something. Um, we see some of them here. Yeah. For instance, there's this notion of neighborhood covers in, in case uh, if, you, if you study networks, I mean, like real network theory, um, they have a notion of cover because they want to sort of have sparse spanners, as they call it. And there, there is a notion of uh, sort of neighborhood covers, and there's a notion of very nice neighborhood covers that have good properties you want. And it turns out this is exactly an overdense. So you have them exactly when you're an overdense. And this happens for many of these. And uh, so what it shows is um, this Novadenseness seems to be a very natural property. Yeah? I mean, it's, uh, it's not a very artificial definition. It looks completely artificial. But uh, it turns out that it has all these properties and equivalent uh, definitions, which means it's, it captures something nice, a nice structure in our, in our graph, yeah? which appears at various places. Um, yeah, so this is just a very quick survey uh, on this. So back to model checking. Now you can forget about everything I just said, yeah, because you see something new. Um, I want to show that on such classes we can do FPT model checking in, in time, which is almost linear. I mean, it's one to the epsilon for every epsilon. Yeah. And uh, we do the same thing that we'll, as we did on bounded degree graphs. Yeah, it's the same proof technique, only a lot more complicated. Yeah. And uh, for for a tra for a change, actually, so far all the results, the the Graph theory was a hard part, and the logic was very simple. I mean, once you know Garten's theorem. Uh, and this is about to change. I mean, here, for this proof, actually, the logic is the harder part. But we do need some uh, nice graph theoretical tools. One is this neighborhood covers, and one is a splitter game, which is a, a nice characterization of Novadens you can actually understand. Yeah? Because it's a game, and games is nice. Yeah? Also, nobody would ever admit that he doesn't understand the game, so it's a better way of doing it. OK, let's prove it. So. Um, for a moment, I do not want to say anything about model checking, but we, we I want to demonstrate the main ideas on a much simpler problem, namely the subgraph problem. So you, you fix a, a connected graph H with R vertices, and the input then is just a graph G, and I want to know whether G contains a, a subgraph which is isomorphic to H. So is H, does H, uh, is H a subgraph of G? That's the main problem. Yeah? And uh, the, well, we will show that this is fixed by tractable where the parameter is uh, the number of vertices in our graph H. And this captures all the ideas we need for the model checking proof. Um, so what happens? Well, if H is a subgraph of G, yeah, because we only have, it's a connected graph and we only have R vertices, it means there must be one vertex in, in our graph G so that the R neighborhood of it contains the entire graph H. Yeah? Uh, and this is the reason why I'm asking for a connected graph. And so if you want to decide this somehow, it would be very useful to understand something about R neighborhoods in, bound, in Nova Dense classes of graphs. But they're actually not nice. I mean, there's not much you can say about them, at least not if you want to be polite or nice. So just, they can be very complicated. But uh, it doesn't help, really, because if we want to solve this, then we need to do something about neighborhoods. So this is what we have to solve. And so if H is a uh, subgraph of G, then H is contained in this neighborhood for some vertex V. And uh, so we can just go through every vertex in the graph, compute the neighborhood, and then try to find H as a subgraph there. And so we, there's no way around understanding how neighborhoods look like in, in, in Nova Dense classes. And here's another definition of, uh, of Nova Dense, which uh, tells us something about neighborhoods. Yeah? And it's defined by a game between two players, connector and splitter. It's played on a graph, and it's uh, parameterized by uh, three numbers. L is the number of rounds we play in the game. Uh, D is something you will see in a moment, and R is the radius of the neighborhoods. Well, D is something you can delete, yeah? so that's why it's D. Okay, so let's play the game. Well, we start on the, the entire graph. Yeah, that's the initial graph we look at, uh, G0. And now the game is played by, in rounds. In the first round, the uh, connector chooses a vertex yeah, uh, in, in the graph. Yeah. So let's pick one. Let's say we, we choose this vertex, this connector's choice. And now it's Splitter's turn to, to answer. And what Splitter can just do is the following. Uh, we look at the R neighborhood in our graph around this vertex. Yeah? And now Splitter can just uh, delete up to D vertices in this neighborhood. Yeah? So you just pick T vertices here. These are the, the blue guys. 
and you choose them ideally in the R neighborhood around your vertex, and this completes the, the round. Yeah, so you know, a connector made its choice and splitter answered it. And so the next round is just played on the subgraph uh, defined plate. So we, we throw away, we go back, everything which is not in the R neighborhood of V1 is, uh, is deleted, and also everything that uh, splitter deleted also disappears. Yeah? And so the next graph we play on is, is this graph, and you continue. Right? So pick another vertex, Let's say, you know, splitter chooses this guy here, a connector, sorry, and a splitter can delete something like this, yeah. uh, and it goes on. Yeah. Um, but what has happened? Well, I mean, this is the R neighborhood in the original graph in G, yeah. but it, something has been deleted, I mean, the, the slide stuff. Yeah. And so in G, a vertex which is on this side, it was very close to the red vertex, yeah, because it was in its R neighborhood, but now we've deleted a few vertices, so possibly the distance now in the new graph is actually far bigger than R. Yeah? So it's no longer guaranteed that everything will still be in the R neighborhood of this vertex uh, V1. Yeah? And so basically what uh, Splitter is trying to do is to split the R neighborhood of a vertex into sort of, to spread it out. I mean, to make it, to increase the radius of this, this graph, you get to split it into several parts. Yeah? And Connector tries to play in a way that everything stays local. And so the rules of the game are this, where we play this in rounds, and we are allowed to play uh, L rounds. And uh, the splitter wins if the graph becomes empty at some point. And uh, if the splitter is not won after L rounds, then the connector wins. So how would we play this game? Yeah, let's say, I mean, splitter is a good guy, but so let's, let's be the bad guys for the moment. This is the graph, yeah? and let's assume it's not nowhere dense. Yeah? probably have no good intuition of what it means to be not nowhere dense. But one thing that's certainly not nowhere dense is if you have a huge clique in it. I mean, there's a huge number of vertices, and they're all pairwise connected. Yeah? And if this is the case, this is where I would play as a connector. Yeah? I would just choose a vertex in my clique, and it's one neighborhood will actually contain all the vertices in the clique. And so what is, uh, uh, and what, what Splitter can do is, well, it can delete, he can delete a few vertices in this clique, yeah, but only D of them. Yeah? And so if this whole clique has more than D times L vertices, yeah, let's say D plus one, yeah, then uh, yeah, we, we delete a few of them, yeah, but the rest will still be a clique. Yeah? I mean, if you delete a couple of vertices from a clique, you, you're remaining with a clique. Yeah? And so in the next one, I would actually pick another vertex of my clique and another vertex of the clique. Yeah? And if the click is big enough, then in L rounds, you can't delete the entire click. So on a complete subgraph, a connector always wins if it's big enough. And this can go, can of course, be extended. Yeah? For instance, if you have an R subdivision of a click, then uh, you can win the, uh, the R splitter game in L rounds uh, as well, yeah? because by the same technique. But let's say if you have a tree, yeah, what happens on a tree? Maybe that's a good example. I'll take a really big tree. The height is infinite, uh, well, it's, it's big, yeah? But uh, how many rounds do you need on a, on a tree? Let's say we play the, uh, the, the radius is something 17, let's say, and we only delete a single vertex every time, and uh, so how many rounds do you think uh, the splitter needs to win on any such tree? The tree is super big and super high. About two rounds, yeah? You choose an earlier food, Yes. And then you separate every node. Uh, the splitter is to uh, leave. Ah, it's yeah, two may, may not be enough, but it's uh, it's about the the right number. Yeah. It's just a little bit bigger. Yeah. I mean, two rounds. What do I do? I mean, I'm the, we can play for two rounds, actually. Yeah? And let's assume this tree is uh, enormous. Yeah? It goes on all the time. Yeah? And if I'm connector, I just pick any vertex, and because it's a tree, it doesn't really matter which vertex I, I choose. Yeah? So now we have only two rounds. How do you want to win? What is it you do? Yeah, but I can remove only one node, so maybe the root. Yeah. 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 So this is the R neighborhood of it. I mean, this is like everything of distance at most R, and you delete the root. Yeah? So what happens is uh, the graph you get disconnects. Yeah? It disconnects now to this subgraph, and this subgraph, and this one, and this one. Right? 
Uh, and this is where we play on. And now I'm connected in my second round. I can pick another tree. I mean, I have to pick a vertex, so let's say I pick this guy. And this is now again a tree, yeah? And you will not make it empty by deleting a single vertex. Yeah? But uh, how many runs do you need? I mean, two is almost there. It's, uh, it's something like the height of the tree. Yes. And what is the height of the tree? Well, initially it's, in this case, in, I mean, there's no bound on it. Yeah? But after the first round, there is a bound, yeah? Because connector chooses a single vertex in, the, in this uh, tree. Yeah? And in the next step, everything of distance more than r from this vertex is deleted. Yeah? Because we only stay in the r neighborhood around this vertex. So after the first round, we are actually playing in the tree of height r. Yeah? And now you come along and delete my root. So the, the subtrees I have left are many, 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 but they have height at most r minus 1. And so the next round of the splitter game will actually be played in one of these subtrees. I'll pick a vertex, but now this thing has uh, is, uh, r minus 1, uh, height r minus 1 at most. Yeah? And uh, so we can continue and continue, and uh, the, the height of the trees will get smaller and smaller, and after some number of rounds, depending on the on r, you, you'll win. Yeah? And there's nothing that connector can do, do about it. Yes, yeah? so on, on trees, you win uh, after a constant number of rounds. And in fact, this works for any... Yeah, you can prove this. It works for any planar graph, yeah, because okay, for planar graphs, an argument you can you should pick a vertex in the first round as connector, and then you only look at its R neighborhood. And you've seen the theorem: the R neighborhood of a, around a vertex in the planar graph is one a tree width, yeah? which means there is basically a tree decomposition of this neighborhood uh, where the bags is only size uh, three times R. Yeah? And so, if you allow d to be three times r, then basically we play on this tree decomposition the same trick. You pick a vertex, and, and I delete the root of your tree decomposition yeah? by deleting r d plus one vertices. And so, you split the tree decomposition into uh, subgraphs, and then you can make them empty uh, very quickly. And so, this is a splitter game. Um, and, and the last remark I want to no, I can do it here. And the theorem you can prove is uh, a class is nowhere dense if and only for every radius r you fix as a constant, there is a number l and d which both depending on r. Um, so that the splitter wins the L rounds uh, uh, R splitter game on every graph in C. In fact, this D is a convenience matter. You can always set D uh, to be one. Yeah? So you can just ignore it. You delete a single vertex every time. It will just increase the number of rounds you play. Yeah? And so you can simplify the theorem saying if you have a Novadense class, uh, then for every radius you pick, there is a constant number of rounds to play that splitter can make uh, can win the, make this graph nt in L of R rounds. Yeah. So why I'm telling this, uh, because I said, well, we need to understand how neighborhoods in Novadin's class of graphs look like. And this is how they do. Yeah? Because I have this big graph, yeah? it's, it's Novadin's and it's very big, and we want to find the subgraph H in it, and, and we, we know it has to be in the R neighborhood around some vertex. Yeah? And so let's play the game. Well, I just choose my vertex where I say this is uh, the neighborhood that contains R. I feed this into the strategy for, um, I'll make connector's choice to be this middle vertex, and then the, the winning strategy for the splitter will actually tell me I can delete a few vertices in here, and this will make this neighborhood sort of sparser in a sense. It will disconnect it somewhat. Yeah? And, uh, yeah, but now it's deleted, of course. You'll also delete a couple of vertices. Yeah? And in fact, you have to delete a single one. Let's just assume D is one. If delete the vertex, and maybe this vertex was needed to find uh, your subgraph. Yeah? Maybe you just deleted the one vertex that your, your subgraph uh, uh, contains. Yeah? But this is not a problem because you can just, uh, it's only a single vertex and you can, can, you can keep it in memory. Yeah? You just remember, okay, there was actually a vertex and uh, it's deleted, I have to take care of it somehow. Yeah? Uh, and this is something you have to do in the proof. But anyway, uh, this is sort of uh, gives us, it makes the, the R neighborhood a little bit nicer, and there you go on. Yeah? You pick the next vertex, and you can look at its R neighborhood, and the theorem just tells you after a constant number of rounds, this will become empty. Yeah? And that is a crucial property which we can use in yeah? the following construction. So we start with the graph G, yeah? we pick a vertex V1, and uh, we look at its R neighborhood, and we take V1 to be connector's choice. Uh, splitter has an answer strategy deleting the white vertices, and this defines as a subgraph. And we do it for every possible vertex in our graph. For each of them, we get this new subgraph here, uh, where the, this vertex corresponds to connector's choice, and this is the response for splitter. Yeah? And you recurse. 
you do this for every vertex in these, these little subgraphs. Yeah? You get a new subgraph and something else you delete. Yeah? And uh, this should go on and you go on. And by the theorem, we you know after a constant number of rounds, these things will actually be empty. And so when you look at this, it looks like a tree-like decomposition. Yeah, it's not a tree at all, but I mean, it is a tree, but it doesn't do anything, uh, of bounded height. Yeah? And if you do parameterized algorithms, bounded height is always nice. Yeah? So what I don't get, if, if I choose L and D to be big enough, can't I always delete enough nodes such that this works? I mean... No, 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 because L and D are constants depending only on the radius. Yeah, yeah uh, on the radius. Yes. So the rate and the radius uh, you can assume. I mean, because you, you've seen the guy, the this model taking result, the radius comes out of guy for normal form. It, it gives us a fixed radius in which we have to evaluate our formulas. Yeah? And this is R is fixed. It depends only on the formula. But this graph is super big. I mean, this is a Moshe style graph yeah, where we say the formula is small and the the graph is super big. Yeah? Um, and it has to be big because if the, the number of vertices in the graph is somehow related to, to R, then in FPT algorithm, it just means it can brute force. Yeah? So we only have to work hard in an FPT algorithm if the graph is really a lot bigger. Okay, so what we've achieved now is we can actually, well, completely destroy every neighbor, neighborhood in a constant number of, in a constant height tree. Yeah? But it's not extremely helpful at this moment because the entire search tree has bounded height. Yeah? But of course, the branching is n because we do this for every, every node in the, in the graph. Yeah? And then in here for every node again, and in here for every node again. So the total number of uh, vertices in this entire construction is something n to the O of the number of rounds yeah? uh, you, you play. Uh, and this is bad because L actually depends on the size of R, and this is the size of the subgraph you wanted to check for. Yeah? And so if you were just to use this uh, search tree here to find the subgraph, it would give us a procedure that runs in time n to the O of L, yeah? But then this is the same as saying it runs in n to the number of vertices in H, but then it's trivial, yeah? Mm -hmm. That also assumes that you can compute this tree. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is something I... which is true, but I didn't really mention. Uh, this proof is constructive, yeah? and it goes out of... Uh, it's, yeah, you can just compute it quite a way. You know uniformly cause whiteness, so because this characterization, and this tells you immediately uh, gives us the proof. I mean, there's a there's a clear algorithm, and it's a very simple algorithm how you would actually uh, compute this answer set. So this is absolutely useless so far because uh, the number of the total number of vertices, if you sum them all up in in these subgraphs, is something like n to the L of R. Yeah? And if this depends on the, the input formula, if this depends on the so graph H we want to find, check whether it's a subgraph, then there's no need to do this. I mean, if, if, if you can afford this time, then you just go through every R tuple of vertices and check if, if this is isomorphic to H. Yeah? So we need to improve. And the way to improve is something that's very nice, I think. I mean, uh, it's called a neighborhood cover. And um, this is a concept studied in network theory and, and, and uh, I think even studied by people who know anything about real networks. Yeah, so it's, uh, um, and before I give the definition, let me just uh, explain what it is. Okay, this is a big network. Yeah, and we want to cover the R neighborhoods in this network. Yeah? Which means we want to cover the entire network by connected subgraphs like this. So each of these things is a little cluster. Yeah? And there's no bound in number of clusters you can use. It's just any number of clusters. And uh, we want two things. The one is, for every vertex, if you look at its R neighborhood, then this R neighborhood is contained in a cluster. Yeah? So, yeah, well, you take a vertex, you take its R neighborhood, and you should be able to find a cluster that contains all of it. Yeah? And now, of course, we want some nice properties of this cluster. Yeah? And so we fix the radius R as before, and then an R neighborhood cover N of a graph is just a set of connected subgraphs. Like I said, they are called clusters. Uh, so that for every vertex in your graph, the, there's some cluster contained in its R neighborhood. Yeah? This is a minimal property you need. And now we have two sort of quality measures on this subgraph, because there's a very s uh, simple R neighborhood cover, yeah? which is the simplest R neighborhood cover you can take. So the first uh, quality measure is we, want, we look at the radius of these individual clusters. Yeah? They're connected, so they have a radius. And uh, we, we try to minimize the radius themselves. Yeah? So we want these uh, clusters to, to have lo, lo, uh, small radius as possible, right? And so the, the radius of a neighborhood covers just the maximum radius of any of its clusters. And one optimization goal is you want to make the radius small, right? 
because the minimum radius you can take is r, because I mean, if it's supposed to contain an r neighbor, the radius can't be less than r. Uh, but ideally, you want to, to cover your graph by subgraphs of radius, something like two times r, three times r constant in r, uh, that achieves the, the, the covering property. And then the, the other optimization goal is actually, you, you, look at the, you look at the vertex in your graph, and you count the number of clusters it's contained in. Yeah? And the other quality measure is you want to make this number very small. This is called the degree of enabled cover. It's just the maximum number of clusters containing uh, a single vertex. Yeah, so it's the maximum taking of all vertices, uh, the number of clusters containing it. And this is the degree and this radius, and these are two uh, quality measures you have. And these neighborhood covers, they come out of, uh, like I said, network theory. There, there's you have two radi radii here, right? I mean, you have the radius yes. R and then the radius of N. These yes. are separate. Yes. Um, this is the radius of the neighbors you need to cover. And the radius of the neighborhood cover is a different thing. Yeah. Uh, and originally, this was studied by sort of uh, people working in distributed algorithms and, and networks. If you say you want to cover, if you're a distributed algorithm, you want to cover your sort of entire network by connected subclass in which you can, can work. And because it's a distributed algorithm and you, you need a low number of communication rounds, they need these clusters to have low radius so that they can actually learn the entire cluster in a, in a constant number of rounds. Yeah. And so this is one way where they were studied. And uh, another is graph spanners. Uh, this is to do about shortest path routing. Um, you want to sort of find a minimum information subgraph in your network that contains all the routing information you need to, to send data from one node to another one. Um, but you do not want to keep the entire network in your memory. Yeah? And so what they do is called a graph spanner, which is a sparse subgraph, uh, so that the distance between any vertices in the sparse subgraph is the most a constant time to distance in the original graph. Yeah? And these neighborhood covers uh, are somewhat equivalent to the existence of these spanners. Yeah? And there's a beautiful paper by uh, Mikkel uh, Torup. I think he's here next week, right? Um, one of the invited speakers at ICARB in case you happen to stay around. Because there's a trade-off between the radius and the degree. You want to make the radius as small as possible, but you, which means normally you need more clusters to cover the entire graph. Yeah? If you just take the entire graph as a single cluster, then the degree is one. Yeah? Everybody appears only once. Uh, but the radius will be big, and so if you make the radius smaller, then usually you need a lot more clusters, and they have to overlap somewhat, and then uh, the degree goes up. Yeah? And that you can prove that you can't have neighborhood covers where the radius is a constant times r, and the degree is also constant. Yeah? Uh, both doesn't ex can't exist. So if you want a ra neighborhood cover of radius uh, k times r, then the degree has to be n to the 1 plus 1 over k. Yeah. But it turns out uh, if you have a class of graphs which is nowhere dense, then these neighborhood covers exist of radius just two times the radius you need, and the degree is just n to the epsilon for every possible epsilon. Yeah. So you can have very low degree, I mean, not super low, not constant, but you can have low degree and constant radius. And if furthermore, if, um, yeah, which means for every radius you give me in every epsilon, there's an, a number n0, so that every graph with at most, uh, at least n0 vertices, we can actually compute a neighborhood cover of radius two times r and this degree bound, and the time you spend is the time we, we have available to us n to the one plus epsilon. Yeah. It's also, also very efficiently computable. And furthermore, if c happens to be close and are taking subgraphs, then this is if and only if. Yeah. So if c is a class of graphs, because I'm taking subgraphs and these neighborhood covers with constant radius and this degree bound exists if and only if you're nowhere dense. And as you see, this is what I said before. I mean, these, uh, these things have been studied in a completely different field, like uh, this graph spinner technology. And it turns out these nice things exist if and only if you're nowhere dense. So, so again, nowhere dense happens to capture something in these, these graphs. And there's a slight restriction of nowhere dense class, which is called bound expansion, and there you get constant degree. Yeah, and this is uh, extremely nice as well. In fact, if you, if, you, if you like this kind of thing, but you don't care at all about uh, sort of model checking, then binary expansion is a very nice class to study because it's an almost uh, nowhere dense. In fact, it's very hard to construct examples which are nowhere dense but don't have binary expansion. Um, and everything here where you have n to the epsilon in any of our results turns into a constant. Uh, on. All right, uh, but why did I say this? Well, because uh, of... Coming back to the slide, we have a bounded height uh, decomposition tree yeah, in, in this neighborhood. And the problem was that the, number of, the total number of vertices appearing here is just too high because it's n to the uh, height. Yeah. But now, let's say we do the same trick. Yeah. We take a vertex here and we look at this R neighborhood. But then we first compute a, a neighborhood cover for this graph. Yeah. 
a bounded degree, uh, yeah, a bounded radius, low degree neighborhood cover. And instead of playing in the R neighborhood of this vertex, we just play in the cluster containing it. Yeah? You, otherwise, everything seems, uh, stays the same. Yeah? So now these things are no longer neighbors, but clusters containing it. Yeah? And then because of this uh, nice degree bound into the epsilon, it just turns out that the, the total number of vertices in the union of all of these subgraphs is just n to the 1 plus epsilon, uh, times a constant depending on, on, on L. And this is nice, right? Because now we have a complete decomposition of all these neighborhoods. We, we can kill them. We can destroy them entirely into the empty graph. And uh, so you can easily solve lots of problems bottom up. You start at the empty leaf. I mean, it's, hard, it's easy to see whether H is the subgraph of the empty leaf. Yeah? And uh, you work away all the way up, and the time you spend is just this time. Of course, assuming you're not sort of spending too much time combining it for um, Okay, so what has it to do with model checking? Uh, this is how you solve subgraph uh, containment. Well, we want to do model checking, and of course, the, the, the trick is here using the Gyphon's theorem again. So we do the same thing as we, we did before, uh, except it's a lot more complicated. But, but otherwise, it looks the same. So we have a basic local sentence. We, we're given the graph. We start looking at every vertex. Yeah. We compute its R neighborhood, and we want to decide whether this local formula is actually true in this R neighborhood. And then if yes, then we call it red. Uh, but this is not so easy to do, actually. This is a, a lot more complicated because the, the R neighborhood, I mean, just pick a vertex. And here, we'll not go into any details at all, but uh, just to, to see what the, the complication is. And um, this is the graph. Yeah? And then we, we look at this vertex, and the question is, does its uh, R neighborhood satisfy a formula? Yeah? And uh, so what we do is we compute an efficient neighborhood cover. And so there's a cluster containing the R neighborhood. Yeah? And uh, we, we play the splitter game. So we pick this as a connector's choice, and then splitter deletes a vertex here. Yeah? And then we want to recurse. This was how we defined the bounded search uh, uh, tree. Yeah? So uh, first of all, there's this problem that we delete something from the graph. And of course, the truth of our formula could de depend on this uh, vertex you delete. Maybe it's the only green vertex you deleted, and the formula just says there's a green vertex. Yeah? But because we're working in logic, this is not hard. Yeah? Because how can, how can we solve this? Well, Everyone else in this cluster remains, yeah? So we just uh, color every neighbor of this node, yeah? By a color saying, I had a red neighbor, yeah? So this information that this was a red vertex, which is now lost, you can just give it a new color saying, okay, I had a red neighbor. Yeah? And uh, then it's not hard to see how to rewrite your first sort of formula, just uh, which uh, is equivalent on this graph minus the red vertex uh, taking this extra color into account. Yeah? Because you can just assume, okay, if you, have, if you quantify over, over vertex, there is an x. Yeah? You can just say there is an x in my remaining graph, or it would have been the red vertex, and then everything I want to say about the red vertex, I can just say because I know where it was. And, and uh, I knew its neighbors, I knew where it was, and I knew everything about it. Yeah? This is actually not so hard. The problem is the recursion, and this is really the hardest part of the entire proof uh, because uh, we have to recurse. I mean, we, we can't evaluate the formula here right away, but it's still a complex graph. Yeah? And uh, in, our, in our prescription, it just says, okay, in this remaining graph, connector chooses a new vertex, and uh, splitter kills something. Yeah? And now we need to check this, uh, this, well, we need to check the R local formula psi in this thing. But how do you check this? I mean, we don't know how to check it. Yeah? The way to check this is you transform this R local formula into a guy from normal form and start again from scratch. Yeah? And life would have been really nice if an R local formula was translated into a guy from normal form where the local parts are R local, but it doesn't work. Yeah? So if you take an R local formula and transform it into a guy from normal form, the radius will grow. Yeah? And there's nothing you can do about it. And so we needed to prove a new uh, guy from theorem actually, which uh, sort of gives some control over what happens in these uh, in this uh, quantified up. Yeah. And this is the main part of the paper, actually, this is the hardest part you, you have to do. But once you've done this, uh, then uh, the same thing works. I mean, now you have red notes saying my R neighbor satisfies the local formula. Uh, we do this greedy stuff, yeah, and uh, yeah, e either we found uh, sufficiently many uh, far apart red notes or not, yeah, and uh, if you haven't found them, then we do the same thing as before. 
time you compute the neighborhood of these things, and then you just check uh, again the formula saying I have an independent set of size k. All right. Uh, so this is the entire model, the the entire proof. Yeah? And uh, yeah, of course, you can optimize this uh, if you want to really solve real uh, problems, uh, dominating sets and so on, and uh, easier solutions. You don't need this guy and stuff. Um, but otherwise, the same trick will work yeah, for for computing dominating sets. Right, so Novodinsk gives the entire sort of the, the final answer for when first our model checking is tractable if you happen to work on classes of graphs which are uh, sparse and which are close in the subclass. I would like to say a little bit about lower bounds. I mean, how do you prove lower bounds? Not because it's so important. Uh, nobody seems to like lower bounds. Uh, yeah. uh, let's just uh, conclude the first part, uh, the sparse part. Yeah. Um, because, okay. I motivated yesterday and I like this program. Uh, I would like to understand for logics I, I like, like MSO and FO, which are actually the two logics I like, um, exactly this kind of uh, question that we found on the previous slide. Uh, can we really characterize the tractability on, on, on classes of graphs? Yeah? And so for monadic second order logic, there is uh, a vague answer. It's not precise. This is what I just wanted to present. Um, if you don't have any extra quantification, so plain monadic second order is wide open, there's nothing we know about it. It's, uh, it's not even clear how to start, otherwise I would have started, but I don't know where to start. Yeah? And uh, for first order logic, we know this as, as soon as you close on the subclass. Yeah? And uh, so unsurprisingly, if you see this, then you will, uh, you will realize what I'm going to speak about in the next uh, hour and a half. Namely, what about if you're not close in the subclass? I mean, what about, what about if you want to go in the dense world and, and get the same characterization in dense cross? Yeah? And this is nice and uh, ongoing, and uh, we'll see what happens. But there are some nice results, and um, I'll present them in the next talk. And should we have time, which I'm not assuming, then I will force the lower bound still on you. Yeah, you can't escape it. Yeah. 